Chicago Department of Public Health, and we are here to give an update on monkeypox, or what we often call MPV, because monkeypox actually has nothing to do with monkeys. I'm really pleased to be joined uh, by a number of experts and partners uh, here in Chicago. We'll hear from uh, David Ernesto Munar, who is the president and CEO of Howard Brown Health, uh, Dr. Stockton Mayer uh, from the Department of Infectious Disease at the University of Illinois at Chicago, Dr. Elizabeth Davis, the medical director of Community Health Equity um, at Rush University Medical Center is here, uh, and then Alderman Tom Tunney um, from, the, from the 44th Ward. Dr. Luna will also give remarks uh, in Spanish. She's our medical director at CDPH. So I recognize that there are folks in Chicago who know a lot about MPV, and I know that there are folks who are maybe just starting to hear about it. So I wanted to set as a baseline, what are we seeing in this outbreak? This is a global outbreak. We've had almost 16,000 cases identified in 72 countries around the world. I want to emphasize that MPV is not a new virus. We've known about it since the 1950s, but normally we only see it in the parts of the world that are in blue on this map in Western Africa. And typically we see a relatively small number of cases that are more from exposure to rodents. The difference that we are seeing now, as you can see in this worldwide outbreak, is that we are seeing person-to-person -person transmission of this virus. It's spread through close, often intimate contact, especially when people develop sores. In the U.S., we are at more than 2,500 confirmed MPV cases at this point in 46 states. I will note that at the international level, the national level, and the local level, this is definitely an undercount, and this is part of why we want to encourage people to get tested. So. The overall risk of monkeypox does remain low, and I want people to hear that. However, here in Chicago, we're at almost 200 diagnosed cases already, 197 as of yesterday. And our first case was only in June, so this has been increasing quite quickly. Most, but not all, of our cases in Chicago have been in men, and specifically in gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. That's largely because spread occurs through tight-knit social networks. So it's nothing specific about being gay, bisexual, or same gender loving men, but that is the social network where we've been initially seeing that spread. Here in Chicago, the median age has been 35 years old. Our youngest case has been 22 years. Our oldest case has been 66 years. You see on the right some pictures of what this rash can look like. You'll hear a little more from the clinicians, but often people are presenting with flu-like symptoms and then these rashes that can look like a blister, look like a pimple, and can be very painful. I want to emphasize that anybody who has a new or unexplained rash we want you to see your health care provider. That would be true even if monkeypox were not circulating. But in this context especially, if you have a new or unexplained rash, especially if you've had some of these viral symptoms, but even if you haven't, visit your health care provider. If you don't have a health care provider, you can call CDPH at 312-746-4835. We will get you connected to care. Remind your provider that monkeypox is in the community. We've been doing a lot of outreach to providers. We had a call late last week with more than 300 medical providers in Chicago, and most of our cases have been detected by primary care providers, which is great. And then if you have a new or unexplained rash, avoid sex or being intimate with anyone until you've been checked out. I want to emphasize that monkeypox is not COVID. Um, we've all been paying attention to COVID for a number of years now. You'll hear some more details, but this really does take, based on everything we know now, close and generally intimate contact. To give you a sense of this, there's been a lot of attention on the concern for respiratory spread. When we're talking COVID, a lot of you now know that we worry about if you've had 15 minutes of interaction without masks, close to close, there's a risk for COVID. 
For monkeypox, we're generally thinking three hours for that kind of uh, more casual contact. And most cases where we're seeing this are coming from much more intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact or, or kissing. So testing capacity, again, different from the early days of COVID, has ramped up and it is plentiful. You cannot get an over-the-counter test for monkeypox. You have to see a provider. But there is now plenty of testing capacity. We're, we can do about 70,000 to 80,000 tests every week across the country. And importantly, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen this expand not just to public health labs, but to the regular clinical labs, Quest, Lab core, et cetera, that providers use, meaning any provider should be able to send a test for this virus. You generally test by swabbing the lesion. Uh, and we really want you to get tested regardless of, um, regardless of whatever you're concerned about. See your doctor if you've got a rash and you can get tested. Treatment is also available, but I want to emphasize there still are some, some barriers here. There's an FDA-approved medication uh, called um, TPOX is the name. It's a pill. At the moment, it's being given to higher-risk patients, people who are immunocompromised. Certainly, if folks are needing to go to the hospital, um, about 5% of our cases in Chicago uh, have been hospitalized. We've had no deaths here in Chicago or across the country. And this needs to be prescribed through a healthcare provider but because monkeypox is in the same family as the smallpox vaccine this this treatment was actually authorized for smallpox and so it is still under what's called investigational drug use for monkeypox which means there can be a lot of burden on our health care providers there's a lot of extra paperwork that has to get filled out we have been advocating hard to streamline this so I just want you to know we know about this virus there's testing and there is treatment, but there is still work to go to make this more accessible. And then finally, vaccine. So a vaccine exists. It exists prior to this outbreak, but it has been in limited quantities. Your doctor's office, your pharmacy, your local pharmacy does not just have monkeypox vaccine on the shelf because in a typical year, we see zero cases in the US, maybe one in a traveler. Uh, and so what's called the strategic national stockpile at the federal level maintains vaccine. The US is acquiring more. They have put in orders for millions of additional doses. But when this broke out, there were only tens of thousands of doses uh, in the whole US stockpile. But this vaccine is FDA approved Approved. It is safe. It is called Genios, and it especially helps protect individuals who have been exposed to someone with monkeypox. So different from COVID, where we say we want everybody to go out and get a vaccine, this vaccine, especially while it's in limited quantities, is for people who have been exposed to monkeypox. We have received and already distributed about 5,000, it's about 5,400 now, vaccine doses to date. Every vaccine that has come to Chicago has been pushed out to healthcare providers, to partners, uh, to some of our higher risk settings. And we have been advocating very hard. Um, and so have our partners, and so has the state, and so has our delegation to get additional vaccine here because Chicago is an epicenter for this outbreak. Illinois is one of the top five states to have cases. Um, and so we are, they are on the road now, 15,000 additional doses, which we expect as soon as tomorrow. And then I, I do wanna really thank um, the Illinois Department of Public Health. The state has also redirected some of its federal vaccine supply to Chicago, given that the epicenter of the outbreak is here. We are using what's called a ring vaccination strategy and I just want to explain that quickly. So on the left, if you imagine an individual in red there who is infected, our top goal is to vaccinate all contacts of that infected case, what you see in the middle. And then if you are able to successfully vaccinate all of the contacts, you then are able to often stop the chain of transmission. If one of those additional people, one of those contacts gets COVID, you then vaccinate the ring around them. This is how we prioritize and work to control outbreaks, especially when vaccine is limited. So anybody in Chicago, it does not matter 
if you are a close contact of a confirmed monkeypox vac uh, a monkeypox case we will get you vaccine a first dose and a second dose we have lots of ways to do that quickly but that is dependent on making sure people are getting diagnosed and our team is doing case investigation and contact tracing. So we have more concern if, for example, there are people who may have had um, anonymous sex partners who can't name their contacts because then we can't get, get vaccine to those contacts in the ring vaccination strategy. And so in that setting, we are also, in addition to this, providing vaccine for the very highest risk individuals based on our current epidemiology. So currently in Chicago, you are eligible for our limited MPV vaccine. Number one, if you had close physical contact with someone or an intimate partner who is diagnosed with MPV, no restrictions. You will get vaccine, first dose, second dose. And that's our ring vaccination strategy. And then secondly, if you are a gay, bisexual, or other cis or trans man who has sex with men, but who also has another risk factor. So the other risk factors are having had intimate or sexual contact with other men in a social or sexual venue, having given or received money um, or other goods or services in exchange for sex, or having intimate or sexual contact with multiple or anonymous partners. And again, this gets at settings where we have trouble identifying everybody for that ring vaccination strategy. MPV vaccine is not recommended for the general public, and at this time, that includes not being recommended for same gender loving men who do not have those other risk factors. As vaccine supply increases, that guidance will evolve, we'll push more out. But we estimate that we have about 125,000 men who have sex with men in Cook County. We've received 5,000 vaccines to date, 15,000 more coming. We have decided to prioritize first doses of this Genios vaccine with the new 15,000 that are coming, and I want to explain this. Um, if you look at the FDA label, you do receive two doses of the Genios vaccine. You get a first dose, and your biggest increase in protection comes after that first dose. And then the recommendation is that at least 28 days later, you give that second dose. We don't see any problem with a decrease in immune response if that second dose is somewhat delayed. And so similar to what the UK is doing, Canada is doing, some other cities here are doing, we have decided that with those 15,000 additional doses, we will especially be doing first dose focus on the highest risk individuals. We will continue to give second doses anybody who's already been scheduled, anybody who's immunocompromised, any known contacts of cases. This means that there probably will be some individuals that may wait longer than four weeks to get that second dose. But again, I want to be clear that the highest amount of protection comes after the first dose. Um, and we know that particularly in the summer, we have a lot of festivals, we have a lot of travelers, we're higher risk generally for spread of diseases. Um, market days is coming and a, and a vaccine does not take effect right away. That's the other thing. It takes about two weeks, 14 days for that protection uh, to kick in. And so with that, um, you will hear some more. Uh, we also have specific guidance around um, limiting your risk in terms of limiting some of the higher risk activities. Uh, Again, I'm going to turn it over to partners, but we imagine folks will have questions. Um, we appreciate your interest. I want to emphasize this is not COVID, but this is absolutely something to take seriously and to make sure we are getting protection where it is most needed. With that, I'll bring up David Munar, the president and CEO of Howard Brown Health, a really critical partner for us in these efforts. Good morning. Uh, my name is David Ernesto Munar. I'm president and CEO of Howard Brown Health, the LGBTQ community health center in Chicago with 11 locations from Inglewood to Rogers Park. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Arwady and the Chicago Department of Public Health, uh, partner agencies, uh, and community, mobilized community members for responding with urgency and compassion to this growing crisis. Uh, responding vigorously now is critical for us to stem the spread of this new infection and to support communities that are most affected. And Howard Brown is so grateful for the vaccine supply that's, that's been made available to our clinic locations 
Uh, we've surpassed uh, 1,000 doses administered and have prioritized vaccinations for communities most at risk. Uh, that includes uh, communities of gay and bisexual men and same gender loving men, particularly in the black and brown communities on the south, south side, west, and uh, also our north side. We've targeted venues uh, where community members are present and also layered vaccinations into our three sexual health walk-in clinics as well as our primary care visits uh, to uh, make sure that people understand the benefits of the vaccine and if they're, if they're eligible, encourage them to accept it. Uh, I will say that I'm, I'm, I am concerned about the moment we're in. Uh, we simply do not have enough vaccine uh, for all those who need it. And uh, we're doing everything we can to prioritize vaccinations for those most at risk. But the truth is, uh, given the, the very limited national supply, uh, we will, we will, there will be tens of thousands of individuals that are eligible and won't gain access. And for that reason, it's gonna be so important for us to continue to expand uh, community education and awareness uh, so that people understand uh, the steps that they can take to uh, evaluate themselves and their partners for any signs or symptoms of monkeypox or MPV, including fever, uh, swollen lymph nodes, malaise, uh, and any rash presentation that may seem unusual. And we also are seeing some of the uh, rash presentation, uh, you know, in, we're seeing it on the hands, trunk, genital area, and also internally. So um, monkeypox can be very painful, excruciatingly painful and dangerous and can affect uh, the ability for somebody to use the bathroom, uh, to swallow or eat, uh, and can cause severe discomfort. And so for these reasons, any, anybody that experiences those symptoms, uh, who, whose partners have those symptoms, should seek medical attention immediately. We can only test for monkeypox when there are uh, active lesions that, that have to be sampled. Uh, they should also isolate and be careful not to share any bedding or linens uh, or towels with others uh, and uh, limit their face, you know, their, their close face-to-face uh, -face contact or skin-to-skin -skin contact. Uh, in addition to screening, uh, and vaccinations and community education. We've also been advising and providing clinical services for patients that are uh, experiencing uh, this infection, helping them understand how to treat their symptoms and recover from monkeypox. And for a limited number of patients that are having severe illness, we are administering the experimental treatment, uh, which has been limited only for folks that have the most severe symptoms. Uh, I want to thank uh, our engaged community members who are helping us sh uh, sh share information that's accurate uh, so that everyone can take steps, uh, take steps to help control the infection until vaccine supply expands. Uh, and I want to thank the, um, the staff of Howard Brown uh, that's been doing an amazing job uh, responding to this pandemic and we'll continue to work with the city and our partners to do all we can to contain uh, this new virus. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Mayer from University of Illinois, Chicago. My name is Stockton Mayer. I'm an infectious disease provider at UI Health. I'm also the physician lead for our outbreak response team at UI Health. I want to thank uh, CDPH and Dr. Arwady for continued leadership. And I want to thank our partners and friends at uh, Howard Brown and uh, Rush University uh, for their collaboration and, and friendship during this time. If there's one thing I want to emphasize, it's the simple word together. Together, we have already delivered many vaccine uh, doses to those at highest risk, and we are positioned to deliver many more as supply increases. We have been able to work together quickly and efficiently because we work together with the many vibrant community-based organizations and local businesses that serve those at greatest risk. We deliver vaccine on-site where people work, live, 
and socialize taking prevention to the community. We will continue to work together to make sure that the vaccine reaches our south, west, and north sides equitably so all of Chicago benefits from its use. We will remember that if there is one of us at risk for getting sick from this virus, we will work together to make sure they are protected. We take great pride in working as a broad healthcare team, and we believe that together we can make a healthier summer. With that, I'd like to turn it over to my friend and collaborator, Liz Davis from Rush University. Hi, thank you, Dr. Mayor, for your introduction. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Davis. I'm a primary care physician at Rush University Medical Center, and I'm also the medical director of community health equity at Rush. And in that role have been leading our monkeypox response. I want to thank Dr. Arwady and the CDPH team, along with UI Health and Howard Brown. We've, as Dr. Mayor just so eloquently said, we have all been working together to fight this. And and I think that's the only way that we can move forward. But it's not just our healthcare organizations and our public health organizations. It really is the engaged community members, businesses, and community organizations that have helped lead this response and help get our highest risk Chicagoans protected by the vaccine. In addition to the monkeypox monkey uh, response that I'm leading, I'm, I am also a primary care physician. I saw a patient last week who I diagnosed with monkeypox when he came to me with flu-like symptoms and it turned out he also had a rash. He had severe disease and we were able to get him treated. And I share this because I think it's important that as a community, we all know what the symptoms are. So we've gone over them and I'm saying them again. Rash, which in the beginning can look like some small bumps like Dr. already showed. Swollen lymph nodes, which can be in the neck, can be in the groin, can be in the armpits. Fever and muscle aches. So if you have those symptoms, please see a primary care provider or call the CDPH hotline so that you can get tested. And also if you have those symptoms, stay away from others until you know what's going on. It's really, it, that is a huge step to stop the spread. Through early, early detection, we can, we can stop the spread by each person not spreading to that ring around them that Dr. Arwady was showing in her picture earlier. And that's also our vaccination strategy as well. So in closing, I wanna highlight the together theme, that together we can stop this, and together we will stop this. And I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Alderman Tom Tunney. <laughs> Honorary doctor. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Uh, good morning, still, I believe. Uh, Tom Tunney, uh, the alderman of the 44th Ward and the Lakeview community. Um, I, I do want to start off a little bit by um, uh, admitting my age. Uh, we saw the range of people that have been infected as, as high as uh, 66, so that's pretty much my age. And um, I wanted to say this. Um, we as a community, back in the day, when I was a very young, uh, gay, 20-year-old, uh, we had hepatitis vaccine. Then we had HIV, and obviously there's not a vaccine, uh, there is at this point, but it, it certainly took a long time. A number of years ago, after I became alderman, we had the meningitis. So we as a community, have got to come together, as was uh, mentioned today, and to support each other. The stigma is gone to some degree. You, you, back in the day, you didn't come out as a gay man, and all of a sudden you're HIV positive. So, you know, we didn't have the healthcare infrastructure that we have today, both public and private. So, what has been said by our previous speakers is. If you suspect something, please go to your physician or go to the public health uh, clinics if you don't have your primary physician. Um, and you know what, use some common sense. We talked about how this is transmitted. This is really with intimate sexual con contact, um, you know, anonymous partners, multiple partners. You know, really, folks, we've got a new strain of disease impacting our community. And we can beat this if we use some common sense 
limit our partners. We're not saying not to have sex, but be smart. We're going to have a lot of visitors coming in over the next month, especially in the next couple weeks. Um, we don't know what, what they're doing. They're here for a good time. We want everyone to have a good time, to enjoy, and to be responsible about having sex. And I, don't, I can't say it any simpler than that. As a, as a member of this community that has survived a number of, of issues over the years, we have to work together, work with public health, forget the idea of having sex with, man, with, with another guy is taboo. You know, we are in 2022. We need to get ahead of this together, and we need to be smart, and we need to protect each other, and also make sure that we have a good time responsibly. The combination of alcohol, drugs, and such, you know what, let's be responsible. And I just want to say that publicly to everyone that's listening, is we can get through this by looking out for each other, working together with public and private health care providers, and really, until we have the, uh, the adequate amount of vaccine, is to be smart and be safe. Thank you. And our next speaker is our medical director, Dr. Geraldine Luna. Doctor? Muy buenos dias. Yo soy la doctora Geraldine Luna. I'm Dr. Geraldine Luna. This part of the talking points is going to be in Spanish. Soy la directora médica del Departamento de Salud Pública y quiero compartir con ustedes actualizaciones de lo que es el virus de la viruela del mono. Hasta el 21 de julio, 197 habitantes de Chicago han sido identificados como infectados con la viruela del mono. También se le conoce como el MPV. Illinois reportó un total de 230 casos, el segundo más alto en todos los estados. Tenemos el virus aquí y se está diseminando rápidamente. Por eso es importante poner atención a las recomendaciones del Departamento de Salud para evitar los contagios y tener más infectados hasta que tengamos una vacuna. La mayoría, aunque no todas las personas que hemos detectado, son hombres, la edad media es de 36 años, entre un rango de 22 y 66 años. Alrededor de 5% de los casos han sido hospitalizados y no se conoce muerte por el, la viruela del mono aquí hasta este momento. El virus se propaga a través de contactos cercano, de piel a piel e íntimo. Y a diferencia del COVID-19, no a través de un, un contacto más casual. Actualmente, el virus de la viruela del mono afecta y se propaga principalmente en hombres homosexuales, en bisexuales, hombres teniendo sexo o contacto íntimo sexual con otros hombres en lugares sociales o sexuales que tienen parejas múltiples o anónimas o que reciben dinero por proveer bienes y servicios a cambio de sexo o que lo dan. Algunos de los métodos más efectivos que tenemos para contener el brote del virus del mono o la viruela del mono son evitar ese contacto de piel cercano y prolongado con cualquier persona que sea diagnosticada con el virus o que muestre signos de infección con el virus fiebre, malestar, tos, destornudo, salpullido o llagas en la piel. Y es importante hacerse la prueba de la viruela del mono tan pronto experimente síntomas similares a los que acabo de describir. Las pruebas de la viruela del mono están ampliamente disponibles. Queremos que si siquiera lo sospeche, se haga su prueba. Es vital para evitar la propagación y de diseminación de esta enfermedad. El CDPH ha distribuido 5,400 vacunas de Genius, que es para la viruela del mono, que se recibió, que ya se ha recibido en, en los centros clínicos comunitarios y los lugares sociales. También se espera que reciba 15,440 dosis adicionales del gobierno federal tan pronto como hoy. Así como 2,600 de la asignación del estado de Illinois, como anunció el gobernador Pixter el jueves. El Departamento de Salud Pública también ha trabajado con socios para dirigir la vacuna que ahorita está muy limitada a las personas con mayor riesgo y espera la entrega, como ya les dije, de 15,000 dosis 
as, al día de hoy. Entendemos las preocupaciones y los temores, especialmente entre los hombres LGBT, que se han visto afectados de manera desproporcional por este virus, pero queremos evitar los estigmas. Esto ocurre por el contacto íntimo entre ciertas redes sociales, no porque tengan una inclinación sexual o de género diferente. Pero pedimos que hasta que haya suficiente vacuna para una distribución más amplia, los miembros de la comunidad entiendan que el Departamento de Salud Pública está tratando de priorizar la vacunación a aquellos que están a mayor riesgo y permitir que los miembros de la comunidad se vacunen. La clave para controla, controlar el brote son control de la transmisión, pruebas para el virus de la viruela del mono, tratamiento y prevención con la vacunación. Las medidas de prevención personal, la higiene personal, aislamiento y de contacto y la evaluación de los factores de riesgos propios son la primera línea de defensa más importante para combatir esta otra enfermedad que estamos enfrentando. Para obtener más información, visite el sitio web de la viruela del mono del Departamento de Salud de Chicago en chicago.gov barra inclinada monkeypox. Y cuídate, Chicago. Ahora les dejo otra vez con la doctora Arwady. I give you back, Dr. Arwady, the mic. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Luna and everybody. Um, I just wanted to, to echo very quickly this, this, this thing about doing this together. These partners standing behind us are the partners that on the ground helped us get COVID vaccine to the highest risk populations at the beginning there too. The folks reaching out to individuals in the homeless community, those who are oldest, et cetera. Um, and I just want to thank all of them um, for their partnership. I also neglected to um, introduce Massimo Piccilli, who is our deputy commissioner at the health department, uh, who is really overseeing this response. Happy to take questions. Well, if you can just introduce yourself, that'd be great to the live stream. Absolutely, Chris Hosh with NBC5, nice to meet you in person. Um, so during the 2015 meningitis outbreak, you know, we saw at that point a number of businesses, I'm talking specifically about North Halstead, a number of businesses that kind of assisted in getting that, uh, that treatment out, that vaccine out. When we do get enough, is that something that you're looking at, you know, as far as partnering with these businesses, when we talk about market days coming up and, and what, you know, all the other festivals? Obviously, that is uh, that's pretty key is, as far as reaching out to a number of people in Chicago. Yeah, most definitely. And in fact, we are already doing some of this. So um, we've been working with Ken Meyer, uh, of the, who's the Commissioner at Business Affairs and Consumer Protection, really thinking about this space. And there are some businesses that that we know may be associated with higher risk activity. And those are settings that we have been working to get vaccine in already. Um, so absolutely, uh, we always follow the data um, and want to make sure that, that first and foremost, anybody who is a known contact gets vaccine, but then also we're pushing it where it's most needed. So yeah, market days is August 6 and 7. That brings a lot of people to Chicago uh, and we will continue to have a concerted effort um, around that, but, but with businesses in general. If I can ask just one follow-up sure. question to that, I heard you, this is not COVID, I understand that. When it comes to mitigation measures though, let's say this you know, gets to a point where we need to take some more steps. Have you thought about, um, you know, when we talk about these settings, going to a club, for example, dancing with other people and, and having that close contact, brushing up on people and whatnot, have you thought about what that may look like if we get to that level? Yeah. So. We have, we've had lots of conversations about, and you know, this is obviously nationally, people are, are working on figuring this out. Um, I can tell you that we have been following, of course, a lot of close contacts who have been vaccinated. Uh, we've also followed a lot of healthcare workers who have taken care of uh, folks who have been diagnosed with monkeypox here in Chicago. And we have seen, um, we've seen no monkeypox conversions in healthcare workers, just to be clear, even some who had higher risk exposures, maybe didn't have PPE on, et cetera, uh, which doesn't mean we don't want to make sure the protection is there, but that's reinforcing for us that some of the more casual contact, it's possible, but it's not, based on everything we know now, that high risk. Um, 
among contacts, especially those who were vaccinated early, we also have generally seen that vaccine do a very good job of preventing further spread. Nothing's 100%. So we are not considering at this point canceling events, closing venues. Um, we are continuing to focus on getting this messaging out around uh, ways to decrease risk related to behavior um, and to work on getting this vaccine out. And that's why we've been pushing so hard for additional doses because we think it is gonna be a combination. The difference with meningitis is there was plenty of vaccine. Um, and when we have plenty of vaccine, it becomes more about um, explaining to people, well, you know, why they need to get the vaccine, and for, you know, it's a difficult situation for us to know that there are many more people who I would like to be vaccinated right now than we have the ability to vaccinate. Um, but I think um, we will obviously continue to monitor as this grows, um, and I do expect it will continue to grow. Uh, Mark Rivera from ABC Seven Chicago. Um, so can you please go over just the prioritization again for yes. those vaccines? Because sure. as you said, uh, you're talking about we don't ha really have enough to get everybody that, that could be or should be. That's right. Um, in terms of the at-risk group that may be getting the first dose and not the second sure. versus the two doses. Yes, absolutely. So first and foremost, anybody with that ring vaccination strategy, anybody who is a known contact of someone diagnosed with monkeypox gets vaccine. Two doses. That has happened, that will continue to happen, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what other risk factors. If you're a known contact, that's our top priority. Our second priority then are the those at the highest risk. And among that group, people who are not known to have uh, a known contact, but who may have had um, behaviors that could put them at higher risk, that is the group where we have made a decision moving forward with this next 15,000 doses to prioritize getting the first doses out. Because um, otherwise, if we're getting 15,000 doses and I was holding back 7,500 of those doses to give a second dose in four weeks, I could only vaccinate half as many people. We've, this has been a major conversation in public health across the country and even around the world. Um, and I think settings that are having significant outbreaks, this is the right approach. Um, and so uh, for those individuals, there is a good chance their second dose may be delayed. Um, and as the vaccine supply improves, we would of course schedule those people, we know who they are, get folks in for second doses. But, um, and if they became a known contact of a case, of course we would do a second dose. We've also made an exception for individuals who are immunocompromised. We will do second doses for them. And if there are others that our clinicians you know, feel like it's very important, we might make an exception. Um, but that is how we are right now prioritizing limited doses of vaccine. We've looked at all the data um, and feel that that is the best way to control this outbreak at this time. And, and can you just reiterate who is in that? That, that higher risk group? Higher risk yes. Group. So right now, besides people who are known contacts, the other people in Chicago who are eligible for a vaccine are men who have sex with men, who also have another risk factor. And those risk factors are um, having sexual or intimate contact in a social, social or sexual setting, exchanging money or other goods for sex, or having multiple or anonymous partners in recent weeks. So it really, and the reason that we emphasize those is those are the folks where we have trouble doing the contact tracing. And so we can't as effectively do that ring vaccination. I will add as one other, just in addition to all the um, really good suggestions and um, specifics, is I would ask people right now that if you are um, having close or intimate or sexual contact with anybody, please make sure you have their contact information. Um, sometimes we see people connect with each other on apps, et cetera, or you're meeting someone, you may not have their information. Make sure you have information because if either of you were to test positive, we can then, in a way that is anonymous and protects your privacy, make sure that contact uh, can get vaccine. So that's just another very practical um, risk reduction measure right now. Any other questions? Or? We, uh, we do have a press release coming out right at this moment that kind of spells that out. Yeah, too. and if you have questions um, for obviously for, anybody for else, anybody. That you're welcome to. And, and I just got our update that there's 202 cases. Okay, as of today. Now, it, it just today's update came in, so just 
just so you're aware, 197 to 202. Um, I do have a question, um, uh, if, if this is okay to ask. It's actually about COVID. Mm -hmm. um, this is from my digital team. They want to know uh, if at-home tests are still reliable with the new COVID variant. Yes, so short answer is home COVID tests remain reliable. Uh, they are what I use if I have concerns. They are what my family uses. Um, certainly, we are seeing the BA4 or 5 variants right now, which are, you know, BA4 and 5 are about 90% of the cases that we're seeing in Chicago. It is the most contagious yet, and it moves really fast. And so I do want to note that we are sometimes seeing people who will have some symptoms, have a negative test for, you know, right at the beginning there, um, and then develop a test, you know, and then it develops positive within uh, a day or two. So our very first ordinance that we passed during COVID way back in the very beginning was stay home if you're sick, essentially. And, and that applies um, when COVID levels are high in this city, which they are. Um, so I encourage people to continue using those tests. Any positive test on a home test, on a rapid test, on a doctor's test, on a testing center, any positive is a positive. You can trust it, you should act on it. If you're feeling bad and you get a negative test, it could still be COVID. And I would encourage you to be careful, especially around those who are uh, at higher risk for severe outcomes, wear your mask, and there's a good chance that you might test positive a day or two later. But yes, the tests remain overall um, effective, and we would certainly let the public know if we were seeing um, a new variant where testing was no longer um, meeting uh, our needs, but right now it continues to. Going back to NPV, uh, when we talk equity, I know Howard Brown, you had mentioned this, uh, how are we making sure that everyone is, is getting this uh, in an equal manner? Yeah, so I'll start and then if you want to chime in in a little more details or any of the partners do. So um, I want to be clear that we have seen people diagnosed with monkeypox in Chicago who live on the north side which has been most of our cases, but also on the west side and also on the south side. And we have been working hard to make sure that, um, just like we did during COVID, sort of trusted messengers are carrying this into communities, um, that we're working to make sure providers across this city uh, can, can get the treatments, the vaccines, understand about testing. Um, Chicago Department of Public Health directly operates some STI clinics, and so of course our, you know, our, our ones on the south and west side as well as the north side are going strong uh, in terms of connecting people if they don't otherwise have care. Um, but I think this is challenging because right now vaccine in particular is um, is being prioritized for a group of people where there can sometimes be a fair bit of stigma around it. And I really, really want to emphasize that anyone who is having possible symptoms of monkeypox, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, get tested. Um, because getting tested, getting the answer, lets us do the strategy that protects everybody else. Do others want to chime in on some of the details, please? Thank you, Doctor. I've got to run. So. Oh, sure. Thank you. Call me about closing businesses. <laughs> we tried that with HIV, and that didn't work. <laughs> I will. <laughs> uh, thank you, Doctor Arwadi. Thank you for the question. I think we we've been thinking a lot about how to make sure that the response is equitable and reaching people who need it the most. Certainly, destigmatizing this um, uh, this outbreak is going to be really important uh, for some communities. Just the name is very. Um, it's stigmatizing all by itself, so we've been really trying to emphasize, uh, you know, it's called monkeypox, but we're talking a lot about MPV outreach. Uh, though we're targeting uh, gay and bisexual men and same, same gender-loving men, we've worked really hard to go to social settings uh, that uh, where black and brown gay men are assembling. So we were at uh, Southside Pride a couple weeks ago. We were at Silver Room Festival last weekend. We've gone to venues uh, north and south to make uh, both information and vaccination available. And then we've been uh, careful to, you know, let people know these, these are the, these are the criteria for vaccination right now. 
if you're if you meet any of these criteria, we can offer you the vaccine based on uh, CDPH protocols, uh, but not really um, um, getting into a lengthy conversation about you know why, when, what what happened, what did you do. It's really if you meet this criteria, we encourage you to vaccinate, and then making sure that we can get information uh, out. I think that the, um, the you know though they they may be unpleasant to look at. Uh, the pictures of what the presentation of the rash looks like on various skin tones is really important uh, because self-evaluation and self-assessment of symptoms is going to be one of the, the most important things that we can do, as well as encouraging individuals to have conversations with their contacts about, you know, are you experiencing any symptoms? Have you seen anything unusual that might look like uh, MPV? Uh, but we, we definitely need to continue the equity uh, push from COVID, from HIV, from every health condition. We know that um, historically neglected communities will bear the brunt uh, of this as they have other outbreaks. Uh, we're already seeing uh, about 30% of our diagnosed cases among Latinx patients and about almost 20% among black African American. Uh, and you know, we've, we're a month into the response. So we, we are concerned that we will continue to see disparities. And we also know that we're, we're only reaching uh, minority people who, who are likely experiencing symptoms and being affected by this outbreak because some people are getting symptoms, don't recognize them, don't come forward. And then, uh, we, so we are seeing some patients that are coming in at the end of their cycle, meaning their rash has started to dry, to scab, so it's in the final stages. We can't test at that point, but we can recognize it and we can, we can identify it as a, as a likely case. Uh, I was gonna, yeah. Hi, I'm Dr. Davis from Rush. I think all, all of us together, including UI Health and Howard Brown, have been constantly talking about the equity issues here so that we can make sure that both testing and vaccination are available equitably across Chicago. I also wanted to highlight, um, in addition to doc what Dr. Munier said, that we are partnering closely with organizations who work with men who have sex with men and kind of co-leading the vaccination strategy so they can help us get to the populations of people who meet the criteria that Dr. already mentioned because we don't want this to be healthcare organizations just doing whatever we think is right. We want to be following the community's lead of come to this event to vaccinate because there will be a lot of people here who are high risk or come over here including um, it may be an event that's in the middle of the night. You know, it may, we, we want to take the vaccine to where high risk people are all over the city, west side, south side, north side. And then in addition, we're following their lead on how to reach people who may not be in that category of social and sexual venues, but may be in the category of multiple or anonymous partners and, may, and how to reach those folks and reach them in a way that's not stigmatizing. So just wanted to highlight our community partners lead on this. <laughs> Thank you. And Dr. Arwadi, um, can you drill down a little bit on the geographic distribution of these cases? I know you, you kind of mentioned top level, most on the north side. Is there anything more specific you can give? Yeah, at this point when numbers are still relatively low, we, gen we tend to keep it relatively general in terms, of, um, in terms of the specifics of geography. The majority have been on the north side, but we also know that um, there is a, you know, a community there th of folks who are um, perhaps higher awareness. And really every day, every week, we are seeing additional cases detected that are not on the north side. And I really want to emphasize that um, as soon as we are seeing a single case, that means that network is exposed and at risk. And so um, I don't want people thinking that this is just north side or just the communities where we tend to have a lot of the largest events. Um, you've also heard me say that not every case has been in a man who has sex with men. Just about all, but not all. And as this continues to likely grow, again, anybody who's having these symptoms, we need to get tested. If you can get tested, we can take care of you from there. But if you're not going to get testing, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, it really limits our ability to help protect 
those you love. Thank you. Great. Thanks, All everybody. Right. Thank you.